Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 8.3 on types of nuclear reactions. Today we're going to look at the other types of changes that can occur in the nucleus besides just the natural decay or natural transmutations that we were talking about on Screencast 8.2. All right. Um, so I first want to start off by saying that all of these reactions that we cover today are going to fall under kind of the umbrella of artificial transmutation. Um, so hopefully this kind of makes sense just looking at the, the term. Artificial means not natural. This is something that is man-made. Transmutation, again, we're just talking about a change in the identity of an element. And this is going to come about because you've changed the number of protons. So in order for an artificial transmutation to take place, um, what we do is we bombard a nucleus with high energy particles. Uh, so basically we force the nucleus to undergo some sort of change. A lot of times this is going to require like a particle accelerator, um, which is a very high tech, very expensive piece of equipment. So this is something that is, is not really going to just happen um, in a traditional lab. You need very specific uh, instrumentation to get this to occur. Um, the big thing that we're going to look for with our artificial transmutations is that you're always going to see multiple reactants. You have to have at least two. Uh, we talked about this a little bit at the tail end of Screencast 8.2. Um, alpha, beta, gamma, positron are four major types of natural decay. You only see one reactant. Yes, I know electron capture is kind of a... Uh, minor exception to that, um, but don't don't be fooled by that. The real thing that we're going to use to differentiate between natural and artificial transmutations is how many reactants are present. Natural transmutation, we tend to see just one reactant. Artificial transmutations, we have to have at least two. So here's an example of an artificial transmutation. Uh, in this case, there's a good chance that you've just got like a clump of aluminum atoms sitting in your particle accelerator. You take a whole bunch of helium atoms and you smash them into the aluminum atom and they kind of just step back and you wait and see what happens. Uh, in this case, you're being told that we're producing a phosphorus 30 nucleus and a neutron. Uh, the same rules apply for artificial transmutation decay equations as for natural transmutations. More specifically, you need to make sure that the mass of the reactants and the mass of the products are equal. We can do that simply by looking at atomic mass. Uh, so 4 plus 27 equals 31 AMU on the reactant side. 30 plus 1, good math I can handle. Uh, it's 30 AMU on the product side as well. So we're balanced for mass and we balance for charge. So in this case, we look at the total number of protons. I got 2 plus 13 gives me 15 protons, or a charge of plus 15. I've got 15 plus 0, so that's going to give me 15, or plus 15 again. Um, so this is a completely balanced equation. Get some of that stuff out of the way. So why am I bothering with that? Uh, go ahead and try some practice problems. See if you can solve for x. All of these are examples of artificial transmutations. So pause the video, try these out, and we'll talk about them in just a moment. Well, let's walk through that first one together just to make sure. Uh, same process we talked about yesterday. 9 plus 1 gives me 10 AMUs on the reactant side. I only have 6 on the products. So X must have a mass of 4 AMUs. Uh, as far as the atomic number or just the charge is concerned, I've got 4 plus 1 or a total of plus 5 on the reactant side. I only have 3 on the products. So we must have two protons in the nucleus of uh, X. So it's got two protons in its nucleus. It has to be helium. And sure enough, X is a helium nucleus in this case. Uh, you might have represented this as an alpha particle, perfectly valid as well. Um, if you do write it as an alpha particle, something like this, uh, please keep in mind that this is not alpha decay. In order to be alpha decay, you cannot have bombardment. You can't take your beryllium nuclei and pelt them with a whole bunch of hydrogens. This is definitely an artificial transmutation. Moving on to the next one, uh, X is equal to curium, CM242. Uh, the third one, we're taking lead and we're smashing it with iron 58 atoms. And this last one is a little bit tricky. Uh, be careful with your coefficients. Coefficient is going to apply to both the atomic mass and the atomic number. Um, and you should end up with uranium-238 as your starting material. Uh, so again, just be careful about those. Uh, don't forget about the coefficients. Right. 
Um, nuclear reactions produce way, way more energy, orders of magnitude more energy than traditional chemical reactions, even if you think about the most explosive, powerful reaction you can imagine. Uh, maybe some sort of like literally explosive material like a dynamite or a C4 or nitroglycerin. Um, nuclear chemistry kind of blows it out of the water. Even if you're talking about the exact same amount of starting material, your nuclear reactions are going to produce far, far more energy than a traditional chemical reaction. This all occurs because of a phenomenon called mass defect. We're used to seeing the whole equal to the sum of the parts. Uh, but according to mass defect, the mass of the individual protons and neutrons in an atom is greater than the mass of the nucleus. And this right off the bat shouldn't really make a whole lot of sense. This seems like it contradicts itself. Uh, we know that the nucleus is made up of protons plus neutrons. How is it possible that if you have a nucleus, um, that the mass of the individual protons and neutrons, I guess separate subatomic particles, is somehow more than the mass of the nucleus itself? Uh, this is something we don't generally see um, you know, in the, in the like, I don't want to say the real world, but in the macroscopic world. Uh, for example, if I took the mass of each student in the class individually and added them up, I should get the same number as if I took the mass, if I took all of the students and put them on a scale or a balance and then found the mass as a group. Uh, so why does this happen? And just to be a little bit more specific, we know this is the very exact mass of a proton. That's the exact mass of a neutron. If I have a carbon-12 atom, I have six protons and six neutrons, and a carbon-12 nucleus is exactly 12 AMU. Uh, you don't have to pull out a calculator to see that this times six plus the mass of the neutrons plus six is not equal to 12. Uh, we're talking about really, really small quantities of mass being lost. Somehow when we take the six protons and six neutrons and we put them together, we end up with 12 AMUs on the nose. In other words, the mass of the products is less than the mass of the reactants. So what has happened to that missing mass? We know from uh, earlier this semester that we can't create or destroy matter. Uh, it turns out you probably know the formula for what happens to this missing mass. Mass gets converted into energy. This is something that only, only, only applies to nuclear chemistry. We will not see it with traditional chemical reactions. You might know this formula, E equals mc squared. This is talking about mass defect. Uh, so E is the energy. M is equal to this missing mass. Again, we're talking about super, super small amounts of mass. Uh, C is the speed of light, which is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And in this equation proposed by Einstein, you square it. Uh, so what ends up happening is these really, really small differences in mass. And you know, that mass defect, or the difference in mass between the protons and neutrons as individual subatomic particles versus the mass of a nucleus, once you put those subatomic particles together, we take that, we multiply it by the speed of light squared, and that's going to tell us how much energy is going to be released. And it turns out you can produce huge amounts of energy uh, through converting mass into energy. It's usually where we see something like a nuclear bomb um, or nuclear power. We're able to take small amounts of starting material, relatively speaking, and produce large amounts of energy. Pretty crazy stuff. Scientists have found a way to capture this energy from the mass defect um, and harness it to do both really productive and really kind of dangerous and potentially harmful things. Um, and the way we can use mass defect in a more practical manner is through what are called fission and fusion reactions. So our two um, more specific artificial transmutations will be fission and fusion. And then let's start off with fission. Fission is the splitting of one large nucleus into smaller nuclei. Uh, we call this original starting material our parent nucleus. And then the smaller nuclei that are produced are called daughter nuclei. Um, we need a really big, massive nucleus to undergo fission. Uh, so a lot of times with fission, you should associate something like uranium with fission. Uh, we can also use plutonium. 
but it's not possible to take smaller nuclei, uh, maybe even something like, like, I don't know, like a xenon, which is relatively speaking a pretty big nucleus, it's still not big enough to undergo fission. So fission is really reserved for massive nuclei such as uranium or plutonium. Uh, what happens is you've got your original nucleus. You're going to hit it with a high speed subatomic particle. More often than not, we use a neutron. If you think about it, the nucleus is positively charged. So if we try to hit it with something like an alpha particle, which is also positively charged, those two positively charged bodies are going to repel and we won't get any change to occur. If we send an electron in, an electron is going to be able to hit one proton, react with it, and form a neutron. Uh, but a neutron is able to, if it binds onto the nucleus, destabilize it. And that's what we're trying to show you in this kind of like middle, I guess it looks like a barbell or a dumbbell, excuse me, uh, uranium-236. And that plus is just trying to show its high energy. So that one single neutron has managed to destabilize that massive nucleus. Uh, as a result, the nucleus splits. We have our fission products, also called our daughter nuclei. And in some cases, you'll produce another batch of neutrons. You can imagine these neutrons are free to go and hit another uranium-235 nucleus and kind of repeat the process. Uh, when we control that, and we do it in a very um, I guess methodical manner, and we don't let that reaction spiral out of control, uh, we're going to produce nuclear power. If you don't control it and you just let all of the uranium-235 atoms that are present undergo this fission reaction, um, it happens very, very rapidly that's when you can end up with something like a nuclear weapon. Um, but in all these cases, we're using fission, taking a large nucleus, pelting it with something like a neutron, and then splitting it apart. We also have fusion reactions. Uh, fusion is the opposite of fission. In a fusion reaction, we take two smaller nuclei and we join them together to make one larger one. This works best when we're talking about hydrogen. We've got to put the two nuclei together. Uh, so if you have larger nuclei, that means you're going to have more protons in the nucleus. And if you take two positively charged bodies and you try to get them to bond together or bind or you know, just really kind of meld into one, you're going to have a lot of resistance to overcome. Um, so for this reason, it really only works with hydrogen. Uh, fusion happens most readily on the sun. That's how the sun produces its energy. It's constantly fusing hydrogen, and due to its size and heat, it's also able to fuse helium. The way a fusion reaction would work is we're going to take isotopes of hydrogen. Uh, so deuterium is hydrogen with a mass of two. We have one proton and one neutron. Tritium, kind of the same idea. Another isotope of hydrogen, one proton with two neutrons. And we join them together at very high speeds, so high temperatures. And sometimes you can get those two separate nuclei to fuse and become one. Often, we're going to produce something like a helium nucleus from this. And we're going to have that one neutron left over in this case. So that's just going to be uh, kind of ejected. And while this happens, we're going to produce mass quantities of energy. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about nuclear power in future lessons, uh, but this is really, this would be an ideal way to produce energy. Um, you've got hydrogen, which is plentiful. We have something like you know, ocean water, for example. We can just split that pretty easily um, using electrolysis. And then we're producing helium gas, which is... You know, it's not really going to cause the same problems that something like carbon dioxide could. Uh, with our fission reactions, we produce a whole lot of nuclear waste. And um, while we do have uh, second and third generation nuclear power reactors that are able to run on that nuclear waste, it would be nice if we just didn't generate any of that in the first place. I nope, don't want to get into that just yet. Uh, all right, to wrap up this lesson, I'm going to go back and look at some practice problems and work on writing kind of these full... Um, nuclear decay equations for our artificial transmutations. Let's check those out. I'm going to talk about questions 2a and 2b. Uh, so you're asked to translate into a nuclear equation, solve for the missing particle, and classify the type of reaction. All right, so letter A says we have neutron-initiated reaction of uranium-235 results in the release of two neutrons, the formation of cesium-144, and another nucleus. All right, uh, so we're told that we're starting off with uranium-235. And it's neutron-initiated, so in this case, our other reactant must be a neutron. 
You can look at table O if you're not sure how to represent a neutron. Uh, we're told that this results in the release of two neutrons. I want to make sure that I write this as 2, 1 over 0, n. Um, I know that it technically looks the same if you just make 2 over 0, n, but that isn't what a neutron is. I need to say that there are two neutrons. I make a cesium-144 nucleus plus some other nucleus. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is figure out how many protons are in a cesium nucleus. And I can do that just by looking at a reference table. And if I look up cesium, I see that it has 55 protons in its nucleus. Um, so before we get into predicting what X is, uh, what is the best way to classify this reaction? Hopefully as you look at it, you think that you should classify this as a fission reaction. It's definitely not natural transmutation or spontaneous decay. We've got two starting materials. Uh, so it's some sort of artificial transmutation. I see uranium present, and I know that I'm producing two smaller nuclei. So this is, in my mind anyway, a dead giveaway that you're looking at a fission reaction. All right, let's figure out what X is going to be. You know, I'll just put it right in there. Um, so I can do the same thing I've been doing uh, since we first learned about decay equations. Make sure that you've got equal mass on both sides of the equation. 235 plus 1 gives me 236. Uh, minus 2, minus 144. Then up with 90. Um, I've got 92 protons at 0 from the, neut uh, from the neutron, and 0 being produced because of the neutrons, and then 55. So that should be 37. And I can check the reference table, see which element is number 37. And I come up with rubidium. So this is my full balanced decay equation, um, or I should say nuclear equation, for a fission reaction. Uh, pause the video, try out letter B on your own. All right, I've got letter B up there right now. Uh, bombardment of a Cl35 of Cl35 with a neutron produces sulfur 34 nucleus and another particle. So there's my chlorine 35. I'm hitting it with a neutron. I'm producing sulfur 34. Sulfur always has 16 protons in its nucleus. Therefore, my missing particle must be an isotope of hydrogen, uh, deuterium. Um, as far as classification goes, I can safely say this is not natural transmutation because I've got two reactants. Uh, we know that natural transmutation usually just has one. So I know it's some sort of artificial transmutation. I don't want to call this fusion. Uh, I know fusion is usually reserved for something like hydrogen atoms, and they, you know, multiple things come together to make a single nucleus. Um, I can see why some people might think that fission looks tempting here. I've got neutron-initiated reaction, and I'm producing other nuclei. Uh, be careful. This is best classified as just an artificial transmutation. Uh, this is not a fission reaction because chlorine is not a big enough um, nucleus to undergo fission. Uh, what we have here is just a simple artificial transmutation. So you can kind of figure that out through process of elimination. All right, um, as usual, there are more practice problems to work on. Um, I would go back up and keep solving for X and take a minute to go through and look for the different clues that you can look for in a nuclear equation to help you classify the reaction type. Um, that's going to be something that you're expected to do on the test. Uh, it's not super difficult, but you need to be careful. And there are, like it's been suggested, definite clues that you can look for to help you make that identification. All right, thank you for tuning in, and I hope you found this helpful.